Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to give an update on the Arctic Observing Assessment, which we have been pulling together for some time. Of course, we had um, several rounds of community input, and um, we have so, uh, we contracted out the actual work effort in this uh, to STIPI, the Science Technology Policy Institute. Um, and they have been working on uh, the 13 priorities that were discussed with this group and in the IARPIC staff meeting. Um, so this is a presentation I gave yesterday to the Committee on Observing Networks for the International Sustaining Arctic Observing Network body, uh, which is, is a joint IAC and um, Arctic Council uh, body. So we called it Societally Significant Observing, Meeting Needs Now for a More Resilient Future uh, to address uh, questions that were posed at the January meeting between uh, several supporters and implementers of Arctic Observe and OSTP and OMB. Um, I just ask if you could mute your mic. Um, we're getting uh, some falling books or something in the background. I'll quickly move through the first few slides because I think I'm preaching to the choir here about the utility of uh, these observing networks. And I was just showing um, visually um, how these are being distributed to uh, decision makers and um, policy makers uh, through various means on the web. And, you know, it is a clear lesson learned, I think, from both uh, the TIPIO and from the um, USGO assessment that um, a visual interpretation of the observing network's uh, value is much needed to communicate. Uh, and that's communicating not only with uh, other science literate peoples, but with um, the public at large and um, residents and decision makers. So uh, there are three examples here. Um, several of these have been uh, demonstrated on this call. If you remember the Arctic Adaptation Exchange that Lil Alessa uh, demonstrated, the Atlas of Community-Based Monitoring that um, Noor Johnson presented from Inuit Circumpolar Council, and then the Arctic Observing Viewer, uh, which is supported to um, visualize all available observing data in the Arctic with links to um, available archives. So uh, taking a page from this uh, and uh, using it to um, support and communicate the significance of all of our investments and our, um, you know, academic interest in observing as it relates to priorities from high-level documents. And those 13 priorities we've um, discussed before, um, they pretty much run the gamut of what I would call the moving list. If you are going to move to a new place, set up residence, um, these are the things you probably want to know. And um, what I find interesting about them is um, they are very integrated. Uh, we often run into the challenge of people saying, well, how am I going to put uh, my phenology measurements with meteorology, with economics, with all of this? It's a, a very human capacity that we do all the time. We do it when we drive. We do it when we're um, relocating, when you're having to integrate information about uh, job availability, with road conditions, with environment. Uh, with uh, the cost of food stuff. So I, I find this a, a very comprehensive and very relatable list. 
And what we are doing now with the assessment is tracking these back through documents to actual data holdings. So we can see where the gaps are, where we're not meeting these societal priorities, these decision maker needs, where we're doing quite well, who are the players involved in those successes, um, where we are providing products, integration and visualization to meet user needs. And these are all uh, metrics and stories we can bring back to OMB and OSTP to say, you know, here's an example where we are really delivering and with additional funds or with partnerships, we would be able to address these other needs as well. So they started with food security and this is the top tiers of um, the hierarchy for food security, um, which trolled through available literature, uh, most of which um, was uh, journal articles with quite a bit of contribution from the gray literature, the so workshop reports, um, state level documents. For instance, we've had a presentation from the Department of Environmental Conservation in Alaska that talked about their water quality program and the types of measurements that they are required to collect in order to make statements about the um, health and quality of uh, freshwater systems in the state. So these are all um, put into a USGCRP type metadata system. It has additional fields that improve our search capacity. And so this is just a single uh, priority of the 13, we've since added information from freshwater security and uh, health and well-being uh, that will allow us to do cross cuts. And uh, we also are developing an online input window uh, to crowdsource information into this universe um, to allow more user inter interaction and also make it a living assessment. So uh, we showcased these um, search capabilities back in October uh, for the SEON Committee on Data and Information Services. Uh, this is also displayed at the Arctic Circle meeting in Reykjavik. Um, and this was a search on Mercury and looking at its connectivity within the uh, universe at this time. And I want to underscore that these are the nodes. The actual uh, data themselves are going to become what I call, you know, the hair on the on the dog here. But they'll be um, numerous and will provide additional density to this structure. But uh, this is the higher order tiers right now. And as you can see on the left hand side, uh, there are links to actual documents that indicated um, yes, mercury is an important thing to be measuring, and this is where it has been um, called out. And so it's not mercury according to me or anyone else, it's mercury in the available literature. Looking at that a little more closely, you can see some of that detail where, um, you know, it's referenced to Northern Pike, to um, the total mercury, to fish consumption, to um, burbot, and, uh, you know, this is based on the documents available to the team, and um, this can be expanded further with crowdsource input via that online form. So just to give you an update of where we are, we have um, added in food, freshwater security and health and well-being to the universe. You can see it's become much more complex, but you can also see areas where you have connectivity between these. As we stated at, at the outset of this activity, um, there will be overlap. I mean, none of these priorities are standalone information is used um, across multiple um, domains and we want to show that relationship um, that only strengthens the argument why certain measurements um, are really critical um, to the observing system and meeting these needs. So the search window on the side shows that you can search by the entire universe or by um, 
individual priorities. You will also be able to search by um, geography, time, um, agency, uh, region, whether you want to just look at Alaska or Beaufort Sea or Pan Arctic, or you want to look at federal, tribal, state. Um, so we um, have an export feature that you can um, uh, export this to an Excel spreadsheet uh, that you can use to visualize yourself if you so choose. But there will be uh, three uh, visualization types readily available with complex search engine capability, um, all packaged together with the assessment, which will be resident on the hub, uh, along with the relational database uh, for um, rapid uh, search and visualization. So we'll have network node, we'll have Venn diagram, and we'll have what I call relational bubbles. They're just three different um, uh, common visualizations of this type of information. And uh, that online form will also be on the hub. Uh, you populate the windows, it creates the metadata file that goes into a closed hold for uh, validation and then appears as a dot on the map. So should uh, our team miss a key node in food security, um, you know, the community uh, writ large can uh, add and, um, and bolster this activity and also make their information known um, if it's not held in a uh, large archive um, or it's not uh, easily found on the web, they can populate that online uh, form to put their information into the table. So, uh, you know, one more quick example um, so you can see the sea ice for walrus outlook here in this uh, expanded universe. Um, you know, of course, at the intersection of sea ice and walrus, but with connectivity to a number of other parameters um, that uh, indicate it's a very integrative um, product drawing on a number of expertise. And um, you can see, you know, this is a sort of fine scale um, activity within these larger nodes. So we encourage uh, everyone to participate in this international activity. Uh, we hope that the search engines as they are being constructed will allow PIs to um, demonstrate the uh, utility and value of their measurements and proposals. It will allow program managers to uh, showcase the um, utility of their programs to uh, other agencies, to their administration, and to possibly lobby for additional funds in areas where we're not meeting those needs. And uh, for uh, connectivity, integration, and coordination to happen, uh, for instance, if we do a search on sea ice, we can see uh, under sea ice concentration all those agencies and actors that are active in that area and provide um, uh, this visual opportunity for them to collaborate and, um, and, and build the community needed to uh, best implement an observing network. So please become a node in the network. Um, the data is currently available on Arctic Hub. Um, we continue to build it out and we have a projected timeline of completion in May of 2015. So hopefully there will be um, a very robust tool to present at the Toyama meeting for ICARP and ASSW. Um, with uh, input received there, it will be fine-tuned in May. Okay. Uh, any questions? Um, you can how to pass the ball back to Judy. Thank you.
Erica, there's a message in the chat message. Do you see that? Um, is that the my Q and A? Uh, let's see. I see maybe Philip could solicit input via the hub. Is that the question you're referring to? No. Um, Judy, do you have it? Yes, I do. Um, this is um, Mika. Um, again, saying hi all. Thank you, Erica, for this great presentation. London-based political scientist talking here. How about including local slash national political structures, geopolitical and geoeconomic resilience indexes as part of your research so as to provide additional density to your data structure? Also, would you say that your work by May 2015 will meet the IARPIC five years plan 3.6.2A milestone for Alaska at least? I'd have to look up what the 3.6.2A milestone is, but the idea is that this will meet many of our milestones and also um, hopefully assist other IARPIC collaboration teams um, that either require this kind of information um, to support their own activity or would like to know how better to link with observing. Um, it is a very large activity. Um, you know, there is not ever a point where it will be quote unquote complete, finished, but we will have the hierarchies um, completed by May, and we will, uh, in partnership with uh, International Data Archives, which was the reason for the presentation to the Seon CDIS meeting in Potsdam, we will, um, you know, add the hair on the dog, if you will, of all of the observing links. In terms of um, the geopolitics, that comes in in the form of the documents that we are um, we are uh, basing all of this in because these 13 priorities are not U.S. priorities solely. These, this is sourced internationally and comes from the 87 strategic plans globally that refer to Arctic observations as fundamental to um, you know, certain societal priorities. So, um, you know, certainly additional depths and nodes and um, can be added uh, through that online form or if they are too voluminous to type in by hand through direct contact with the Arctic Hub developers. I hope that's right. I guess I would add uh, I would ask Carl, since I think he's still on, do you see this as a useful tool for um, your IARPIC team? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm having some issues with the mute. Yeah, I think uh, this could be useful as far as, uh, you know, connecting information between the different studies and whatnot. So, um, although I have to admit I haven't been into it very much, so I need to get into it a little bit. But, you know, if you look at Philip's presentation, you know, I think linking some of those items together would be helpful in the long run. And I think you're right. I think this could solve a couple of uh, the IARPIC uh, milestones. I don't know which one was specifically stated there, but, you know, I think it would help a lot in a couple of different areas. Hello. 
normal. Hello. Erica, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, there we go. This is Peter Griffith. Um, Thank you. I've, uh, uh, I have to um, uh, say that it's all visually very striking, but uh, I have, um, to be very frank, I have very little idea how one is supposed to use this. Um, is there a, uh, a tutorial or an orientation or something like that to, to, to show how one takes advantage of this data, data visualization? Sure. So, like I said, right now only the beta is on the Arctic Hub, and you can basically zoom in and zoom out and search on some keywords. Um, but we'll have um, a more advanced interface on the Hub that is currently in development. Um, we had to finalize the metadata schema before that could be undertaken. But, um, you know, what I would see it as is, um, you know, once that uh, fine detail, the actual connection to the data um, is in place, you know, if you are the um, implementer of, say, you know, um, a flux network, a terrestrial flux network, you know, you could search the universe for, you know, flux plus terrestrial, and it would show you all of, you know, the uh, documents that count this as, you know, an absolute necessity. It would show you a network node diagram that would link it to all of these priorities. You would be able to know which agencies are um, supporting this activity um, globally. And um, you would be able to understand um, how the reference to terrestrial fluxes has changed in the literature over time. Uh -huh. um, you know, so I think there's just so many different ways it could be used. Um, it depends who you're packaging the information for, but <clears throat> I think Ultimately, what it would be able to show for you is, um, you know, where your interests sit within this universe, um, where there are breakdowns in that con in the connection, and that could be that either we're not collecting the information that people say they need to make decisions, or uh, quite often it's that that translational document that it takes you know, some high level need like food security. They didn't take that and say, this is what food security means to us and this is what we need to know. Um, oftentimes those documents are either, you know, not easy to find because they're not journal documents or um, they haven't been written. So it's hard for us as observing supporters and implementers to observe something and connect it to the higher level goal if there isn't that sort of um, mid-level translation. No, it's, uh, it's, it's very thought-provoking um, and um, clearly there's a lot to get one's mind uh, around here. Are the, are the developers of this in the DC area? Is this a... Uh, Yes, so SIPI is a federally funded research and development center that's attached to OSPP. So they have a team of 12 uh, hearkening from various, um, you know, disciplines. We have a health specialist, we have a law specialist, um, you know, different environmental specialists, a CI person, and their job essentially is to, um, go forth and find those documents and work it back from there. And we gave the example uh, some months ago with food security that there was a workshop report submitted in November of 2013 by the Inuit Circumpolar Council that said these are the 28 things that we need to know to assess our local community food security. 
And um, they really ran the gamut from things like fuel economy to wildlife health to, um, you know, accessibility of hunting grounds. And so in those instances, we have to step down even further and say, well, what did you mean by wildlife health? Are you talking about caribou health? And then is it the population size and the tissue and this and that? So it, like what I was showing you were the upper tiers. There are things beneath that that um, provide greater detail and connectivity, but essentially it allows us to then say, you said you needed to know wildlife health, and this is how you defined it. Here it is. Here's the data that you need. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking how uh, with, with NASA's above uh, project, then there's, there is a, uh, I'm not sure uh, how recently you've been updated if you've seen the concise experiment plan. Um, uh, I, I know that uh, I mean, you probably know uh, Diane Wickland and Eric Kozuski, uh at least, or know of them. Um, yeah. The um, who are our program managers at the at the headquarters level. Um, I'm wondering. We above has some aspirations for taking some of the of the more traditional um, sort of uh, ecosystem forcings, ecosystem dynamics kinds of observations that a NASA project would would uh, approach and uh, try to map that to ecosystem services and the consequences to changes in those to society and. Um, I'm just wondering if this is a tool that we would use potentially in the planning process uh, for some of the uh, the, the uh, implementation plan, uh, or if it's something that we would contribute to during the course of the next you know five or six years as we execute our field work, or maybe a little bit of both. Um, uh, you might not know the answer to that at this point. I think it would be both. Um, you know, based on timing, I mean, of course, we do have a, um, a high level priority related to ecosystem health, but of course, it's going to feature in other priorities as well as it relates to, um, you know, uh, the environmental change, climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. I mean, that's the point of it being a relational database is while, you know, your activity goals might be, um, you know, predicated towards that ecosystem services, um, there are going to be several other um, venues where that information is going to be valued. So, uh, you know, in the context of ecosystem health, we will build out the hierarchy. We could reference your planning document and, and the variables that you have there. You can see what the relationship of what you plan is to what other uh, nodes are within ecosystem health and other related priorities. And then uh -huh. as you implement, you know, you could adjust, um, add to, and include the links to the data. So um, it is going to be, like I said, constant iteration, but I mean, that is the reality we live in. And some of these other assessments, which sort of take a snapshot in time, um, you know, by the time they've been published, the ship has sort of sailed. So that's why we wanted to have this online interface. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. This is Carl, Erica. If uh, I, I guess I'll use this as an, an example, but if you go out to the site and you click on Arctic observations and then you go to freshwater security and then you go to other human use, when you click on other human use, you, you, you lose the link between freshwater security and observations. I mean, it doesn't show. Is that planned in there? Because once you farther get farther and out and out, you lose your links as how you got there. And I was wondering if that was a planned feature of it, or is it some way that you can actually those multiple links as you go further out? 
No, it's not a planned feature. Um, you know, I what I task them to do is to have something available for people to play around with um, until we have the full schema um, to transfer over. So the schema itself is being developed by Spippy, and then it's being uh, parceled over piecemeal to the hub. Well, only once the entirety of the schema is delivered can we implement the real visualization. So um, I, I just wanted to get uh, some initial reactions to the concept and to the build out so that while we have them under contract, if there are key needs or um, ways of interaction, that people would prefer, we can do that. Um, but after May, Stippy will fall away from this activity and it will become primarily in the hands of the visualization team on the Arctic Hub. And um, so, you know, please do send us your feedback and, you know, in this instance, you know, even though we, we don't plan for that to be a feature, having that in an email from you is something that we can include in our comments. Does it just be able to, you know, if you're going along through here, it'd be nice to follow your link back to how you, well, you can do it. It'd be, it'd be nice to see the linkages from where you started because right now it's lost. They have to piece that together to be to find out where you've been and how you got okay. there. I mean, I like I like it, but it's just and it's got a lot of information. But just to have that pathway, cookie crumbs, if you want, to how to get, how you got there in the beginning. So. No, that's great. Well. Um... If you don't mind sending that to me as an email, it always helps me to have a paper trail, if you will, so that uh, when we have our next development meeting, we can, um, you know, ensure that they've heard that from more than just us. Okay. 